Okay, let's keep moving along here. I know we've got to cover a lot for this first week because I have to give you everything you need for optics to start working with some basic optic elements. And so the next thing we're going to talk about is reflection. And this one will be a little bit quicker than the uh, previous lectures, okay? And so the simplest place to start is a mirror, okay? It's specular and planar, meaning that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the, basically the angle of incidence and uh, reflection are the same. And so that's what you define essentially for all these rays of light coming from a little emitter here. The incidence angle and the reflected angle are the same. So that's how you define a mirror surface. There are different types of reflectors, such as a parabolic reflector, okay? And if you look at that type of reflector, what you have is all the rays converge to a single point. And if you look at your headlights, for example, on a car, they use a parabolic reflector where they put the lamp that's emitting the light here, and then they have a parabolic reflector like this, such that it expands the light, but keeps it all uh, parallel and collimated as it moves forward, okay? There are two applications. One I just mentioned, headlights, but also this is used for solar cells. When you have really expensive solar cell chips, some of the best and most efficient ones, you use a parabolic mirror like this to take the sunlight and concentrate it onto the tiny little chip where it can do its job and then convert uh, light to electricity. There's also even more fancy ret reflectors. There's retro reflectors. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but this is a unique type of reflector where, as you can see here, each XYZ component, because we're in 3D space here, gets reversed by each reflection because when you go from incidence angle to reflected angle, you basically reverse, at least in this dimension, one element of X, Y, or Z propagation. Okay? And so if you have three such reflectors, then you'll basically invert X, invert Y, and then invert Z. And that gives you a complete reversal of all three, which puts the light right back towards you. So when you're driving down the light at night and you look at the stop signs and the road markers and they look really bright, that's because they're made out of these little corner cube retro reflectors where they take your headlights and they reflect them right back at you by having a film full of these little three-sided little features here. Okay. Now, not all reflection is mirror-like, which is referred as specular. Some reflections are diffuse, which is referred to as Lambertian. And so a specular reflection, angle of incidence and reflect, reflection are the same. Spread, the surface gets a little rough, and I start to see different angles come off. And diffuse, it's actually reflected in all directions, like a piece of paper. And how that works is basically, if you look at a piece of paper, the light comes in, and then you've got all these different fibers of wood essentially surrounded by air and so you get all these different Fresnel reflections and refractions such that the light gets tossed around reflected and refracted in all these different directions and it basically gets diffusely reflected in all directions and so hence you get the difference between a mirror-like surface and a paper-like surface now it's a little bit more sophisticated when you look at a diffuse or Lambertian is the term for it um, surface it's sophisticated and unique in that here's my intensity coming in, E. Lambert's cosine law for a perfectly Lambertian surface says that the intensity reflected decreases as cosine of theta from the surface normal. So here's the surface normal, where I'll start with 1 for cosine of theta. And as I go to larger and larger theta angles, my intensity falls off with the cosine. Notice how these arrows are getting shorter. That's just basically tracking the magnitude of my intensity there. Okay? And so that might seem kind of funny, though, because you could say, well, if I'm looking at a piece of paper, I know that if I look at it from up here and here's my eye versus looking at it over here and here's my eye, that the brightness of the piece of paper looks the same here as it does here. But I said, wait a second, the intensity reflected here is decreased with the cosine of, of the angle. So that doesn't make sense. Actually, it does, because if you look at how your eye collects the intensity, if I was looking directly above this with my eye, I'd be up here, and here I am off at an angle with the eye, okay? Above this, if this is my width of my eye, essentially, or my, my area I'm viewing, I have this much area, and I have all this strong intensity, as predicted by this uh, Lambert's cosine law, but when I go off angle, if I have the same area here, but look what happens when this area hits the surface. I'm collecting from a larger area here. So even though the intensity is less, 
I'm collecting more of the area. And so if you look at this effect of going to larger angles and collecting off a larger area, it exactly cancels out this effect where the intensity reflected falls off as I increase my reflected angle here. So that's why paper looks the same brightness from all directions. Now, there's one other reflection that you've seen before, but you probably never thought about it, and that's when you're looking at a piece of glass, you can see a little bit of reflection in it. You look at the, a window, you can see a slight, a slight bit of your own reflection off the surface. That's called Fresnel reflection. So let me try to explain that to you, and it's, it's not that complicated. And so, basically, if you look at light propagating through a medium like air, or here you have glass and you have air, you get a little bit of Fresnel reflection off all the surfaces, and that's why you see your reflection in a piece of glass, okay? Now, the reason why you get this, okay, is that if you look at light propagating in air, there's, and we'll talk more about this later, but there's something called, um, I don't know if I even talk about it, there's something called Huygens' Principle, in which basically you have a, you know, if, if light hits an, hits a, if light, electric field comes along here as an atom, it can cause the electron cloud to oscillate back and forth. Well, if that's moving charge, that can create a photon itself. But if you look at a medium that's the same density of, of atoms, same refractive index, Interference forces things to keep moving forward. However, when you go from refra one refractive index to another, you break up the symmetry of this system, and you get a little bit of the light re-radiated backwards. Okay, and that's why you get this Fresnel reflection off these surfaces. Okay, so this is why a metal surface is much more reflect more reflective than glass. If you look at a metal surface. You have a ton of electrons in the metal, right? And they move very easily with electric field. And so I have a photon coming in. It's got an oscillating electric field. It causes the electrons to oscillate. That also causes photons to be re-emitted, right? Because if I move electrons, that's a moving charge, I have a time-varying electric field, which creates a time-varying magnetic field, and I get a ton more reflection back. So that's why metals can reflect as much as 95% Whereas glass only gives you a small reflection because it's not the electrons moving, it's just the electron orbitals moving a little bit, kind of like that rubber band trampoline analogy we used for how refractive index works. And so glass gives you a little bit of Fresnel reflection, and metals give you a strong amount of Fresnel reflection because you have a very strong effect of electric field causing electrons to oscillate which then re-emit the photons, but in the opposite direction. How do you calculate Fresnel reflection? Well, let me mention one more thing. A metal is not perfectly reflective, though. Okay? Fresnel reflection, there's no loss. But for a metal, there is a loss because you're actually moving charges through a material that has a resistance. And when you move current through a material with resistance, you generate heat. You get ohmic loss. And so metals are not perfectly reflective because a percentage of the light just heats up the metal, okay? Glass is pretty much perfectly reflective because you don't, it's an insulator, there's no net current, so an electric field doesn't cause, you know, the electrons around an atom, they don't leave that atom and move through the material, they just basically get, get kind of moved back and forth like rubber bands, right? And so they're perfect, like I said before, with, with glass or refractive index, it's an elastic effect where it gives its energy back to the photon versus a metal where you move those electrons in the metal, the free electrons, they cause a little bit of current flow, and that gives you a ohmic, ohmic loss, which generates heat. Okay, so now how do I generate refractive, how do I calculate refractive uh, Fresnel reflection off refractive index? It's pretty simple to calculate. This is for incidence angles close to zero, meaning coming straight at this thing, the amount of Fresnel reflectance is the refract difference in the refractive indices over the sum of the refractive indices squared. That's it. So look at air and glass. Here's air, here's glass. Take the difference, take the sum over each other, square it. Each surface reflects about 4%. And so as I go through here, I end up with 92% through with 4% ref Fresnel reflected to each of these interfaces. Now, it gets a little bit more calculated as you change the angle. 
So if I look at the full calculation for a Fresnel reflection, and now I allow my incidence angle no longer to be perfectly normal to the surface, but I allow it to increase, then I will see that my reflection coefficient changes with incidence angles. So this is the amount of light reflected. In fact, if I go to a really large incidence angle to the point where I'm just barely glancing the surface close to 90, my reflection goes to almost 100. That's the same thing when you're looking at the, a, a lake, okay, and you look at the water and it looks all shiny. It's because you're looking at light glancing off the lake at really small angles, okay? Now, you have to be careful when you calculate these things because this then starts to become dependent on which way the light is polarized. And so there's two different reflections here. There's one for the blue line and one for the red line. Look at the blue line first. This is for what we call S-polarized light where the magnetic field, in this case, would be parallel to the plane of incidence. So if these are my angles here, then these angles are within this plane of incidence. And so that means for this photon, the electric field would have to be in this plane. and I mean, the magnetic field would be in this plane. So magnetic field parallel to the plane of incidence. Okay, And then the electric field would be perpendicular to it. In that case, I use this equation as angle incidence and refracted changes and I get the blue case here. Okay. If I have p-polarized light the electric field will then be oscillating in plane and the magnetic field will be perpendicular to it. Then I have the red line and you can see you get the special case here with this equation where the reflect for now reflection goes to zero right around 57 or so degrees. That's the Brewster's angle meaning that if you have the right polarization of light they'll get no, you'll get no glare or reflection off this surface. Okay. Now, this is for the case of going from low refractive index into high refractive index, and of course you can see the case when you go from high to low, and then you see total internal reflection, because when you go to high to low, you get to a large enough angle of incidence, eventually the light is internally reflected. Be careful with these terms. People toss them around a lot, and they don't necessarily use them clearly all the time. There's S and P, they say TE and TM, so every time you look at these, if you come up with them, be careful to try to trace it back to the principles I describe here so you can understand them. Now, mirror quality varies, and I want to mention there's a couple different types of mirrors. In this lab, we're mainly using aluminum mirrors. So this is wavelength, and here's reflection. You can see you get pretty good reflection. You've got gold mirrors, higher reflectivity, but not as good in blue, which is why they look gold. And then you've got silver mirrors as well. Okay. There are also very fancy mirrors called dielectric mirrors, just made out of layers of different of glass with different refractive index. We're going to talk about that in lecture three, how you build these up. These are fancy because their reflection is 100% over a given wavelength set of wavelengths of light. Again, we'll talk more about that in lecture three. The mirrors in our lab are a combination of both. It'll be something like aluminum with a little bit of a dielectric coating to boost up the reflectivity. And that's most of the, the mirrors we use in this lab. All right, at this point, do a little bit of review, take a break, and we'll start to wrap up the, uh, this first lecture.